I've just really enjoyed being here and hearing the conversations um, yesterday and today. Um, and really want to start out with with thank you. Thank you for everything that you all are doing here in this community. I think, you know, and as I'll talk about so much of what I do at Walmart is really at the macro level, um, but it really takes these conversations and these conferences um, to hear about the interventions that you all are doing here in the community for us to be able to learn and take it to scale. So I just really want to start off with that and, and say thank you. Um, I'm also fortunate that Walmart is usually a household name. Um, so I don't usually need to go in and talk about what we do as a business, but I did want to start um, kind of with, with our mission statement, um, not just so you kind of learn it, but um, there there's some phrases in here that grounds my work and does, it's why I get up in the morning and go to the office, and it's also what keeps me up at night. Um, and so we are a people-led, tech-powered, omni-channel retailer, helping people and money, help people, helping people save money and live better. Um, I'm not going to talk about tech, though I realize today is mostly focused on tech enablement, um, but it is what we do. Um, but for us, or for me specifically, it's really that people-led piece and helping li people live better, which I think you probably are all kind of rolling your eyes because you say, well, that's what I do too. Every single one of your organizations does that. Um, I think you know we all work in the social sector and we're all striving to help, help people live better. But for us and our scale, it's 90% of the US lives within 10 minutes or 10 miles of a Walmart store. And so when we think about our customer base, at any given day, our stakeholders can be impacted by a disaster. I also think about our associates and the people-led piece. Our 2.1 million associates across the US, at any given day, they can be impacted by a disaster. In the recent wildfires in Washington state, we had five associates who lost their home. In Hawaii and Lahaina, we had one associate. I know we've had associates here in California lose their house as well. One of the hardest days for me in this job um, was December 2021, when you found out our associate, Rachel Brown, and her four young kids perished in the uh, tornadoes. So we live it on a daily basis, um, and that's why this is important for me to be in this role and support the communities where you live and work on a daily basis. So to kind of give you the framework on how we think about um, how we impact uh, the communities and work on the different social issues that we work on, we really think that it takes the business and um, society married together to make a difference. And so we take the shared value model in all of the issues that we focus on across our sustainability, opportunity, community, and our Center for Racial Equity work. And so really the shared value model is thinking about systems change. How can we take some of the lessons that you all are sharing here on the ground and change the systems that are impacting the work? Um, we think about where we can lead through the business. Where are there opportunities for us, whether it's through our supply chain or our, our reverse logistics, um, or even our physical presence in communities to make a difference? We don't focus on every societal issue because it would just, one, take too much. We don't have the budget to do so. Um, and so we really need to be super hyper-focused, especially if we're gonna think about changing the overall system. Then we think about complementing with philanthropy. Um, you know, I think we can invest in some of the tech enablement, some of the interventions, some of the experiences um, that you all are doing um, to think about, like I said, taking it to scale and so forth. And then finally, we just can't do it in a silo. We can't do it by ourselves. It takes collaboration. Uh, we need to work with community-based organizations. We have to work with other funders, other companies, um, academia, to really think about how do we get that macro level systems change approach. I'm gonna come back to this slide. Um, so when I asked Jen uh, what she wanted me to talk about, she said, well, I don't know if the audience necessarily knows how focused you all are on equity. Um, and also that you do do more than just respond to a disaster, that we also focus a lot um, on preparedness as well. Um, and so I, wanna do, I do wanna touch on this equity piece, and I think this, um, this statement is 
especially powerful. Um, it came, it comes from an article that we funded with uh, the Brookings Institute on really how do we think about reframing um, the Stanford Act and disaster recovery. I appreciated the question earlier on if we were just to rewrite everything, what would it look like and let's put it on the shelf and have it ready because um, we're definitely a strong proponent of that. But I think what's important about this quote is unless you're gonna explicitly focus on equity as the problem and in the problem statement, you're probably not going to have equitable change. I think so many of the programs um, and question statements that come up say, well, we need to reach this, com this community with capacity building. Oh, and by the way, we, we need to make sure it's equitable. Let's reframe the questions and say equitable or underserved communities are not equitably getting the resources they need. So how do we solve the problem for that? Um, so these are kind of the stakes that we put in the ground as the four program pillars um, when we think about the disaster work for walmart.org, which walmart.org is the brand that is uh, the Walmart Foundation and Walmart Corporate Giving. Um, but as you can see, it's really underpinned by how do we better serve underrepresented communities across the country. Um, I'm gonna get, go a little bit deeper on the communities prepared before disaster, um, but that is one of the first pillars. Really, how do we build the capacity and, tech and provide technical assistance to these communities um, who are looking to strengthen and become more resilient? Um, you know, we're at a historic time, it's been talked about several times at this conference, by how much funding is available to these communities right now to be more resilient. Um, but as we've seen, a lot of that funding is getting streamlined to the larger communities um, who have access to the capacity. Walmart is the first destination after disaster. Um, you know, I think if, if you know Walmart in the disaster space, it's probably that we do respond to disasters. Our origin start story really comes after Katrina when we realized that we had supply chain logistics, we had the product to donate, we knew the routes to get into New Orleans, um, and that we could actually make a difference for these communities. Um, now with um, 5,500 stores across the community, we really think about our parking lot as a gathering space for these communities as they're impacted by the disaster. We want to be that store of the community, we're in the communities, um, we're in your community where our associates live, where our customers shop, um, and we want to be a trusted place so that when a disaster hits and you don't have the information, you'll probably be able to get the information at a Walmart. You'll also be able to take a shower, do laundry, be fed, get the supplies you need, and then go to the next spot. As the largest uh, retailer in the country, uh, in-kind support is definitely something that we focus a lot on. Um, I know you heard from one of our partners, um, Jim Alvey with Good360, working very closely in thinking about coordinating that supply chain during times of disaster. Um, but sometimes product donations can be a disaster amidst a disaster. It can be a little bit of the wild, wild west, um, and we recognize that. We also feel the pain because oftentimes we're getting about 10 requests for the same thing to the same place from different partners. And so thinking about investments that we can make to help strengthen those relationships um, and build better coordination um, to use, to steal the good 360 phrase, get the right stuff at the right time at the right place. And then lastly, um, there's, uh, really enjoyed the conversation earlier today and appreciate all of the input that you all have put in on um, reforming disaster uh, response and recovery and what that can look like. You know, as we think about our customer base, as we think about how disasters affect our associates, how can we improve the disaster survivor experience and make sure that we can use our influence or invest in um, in different changes, whether it's tech enablement or different experimentations that you are doing in the community at a larger scale to make sure that if you are impacted by a disaster, it's not adding on additional stress and doing so in an equitable way. So thank you to BPC and the task force um, for leading some of that work for us. Um, continuing to focus on that is gonna be a priority for us. So as I mentioned, um, the, the community is prepared in advance of a disaster. 
So we made a commitment in spring of 2021, um, it was a $3 million commitment to really think about these three areas and how can we use our philanthropy to invest um, in some different models that can help build uh, the capacity and technical assistance in these communities. Um, as we heard from um, the Sonoma Permitter yesterday and some of the great success they've had in getting this funding, it's gonna make an incredible difference in their community. But she also mentioned how much work it is and the added capacity that she's needed in that office. And not every community has that ability. And so we wanted to think through what are some different models that could be in place to really focus on that capacity building from a community-based organization? What could we place at the municipal level to help them look for different funding opportunities, apply for the grants, make sure they're hearing from underrepresented, underrepresented communities um, in that community? Uh, and then lastly, really, what are some of the barriers? Why, do the, why is this funding continually going to these larger communities and not to the communities that really need it the most? Um, and so it's been a two-year project. This was even before um, FEMA released their community disaster resilience zones, um, which we're now very excited about that designation. Um, we're gonna be really using that, leaning into that framework. Um, I should note, this investment was really focused in the Gulf Coast. Um, we are gonna continue to focus in the Gulf Coast, but our goal is to really think about what are the interventions that can be scaled and used at a national level to impact every community across the US. Um, so I am going to leave, leave you with this, and then I'm happy to take any questions, Jen, but I think as we think about equity um, and as we think about um, the impact that some of these models can take, um, so thank you to SVP, who's one of the grantees in that program, as well as IDIM, who you heard from Chauncey earlier. Um, <clears throat> we supported a fellow in Lake Charles, um, Louisiana, um, who identified a grant program through HUD, their choice neighborhoods, um, and identified the grant program, worked with the community to understand the opportunities there, listened to their voices, um, found out what they needed, and they put forth a proposal for was it 500 low-income housing um, in Lake Charles. As you can see from this quote from the director of Lake Charles Housing Authority, um, this grant application had the most input from, vulnerable from the vulnerable community um, and the, the stakeholders that they really wanted to hear from. Um, this quote was provided to us at the beginning of the year. Um, so right after they submitted the grant um, and before they knew what the outcome would be. Um, excited to share in July, they actually received the funding. Um, they were the only small to mid-tier community um, that received funding through that grant program. The other uh, communities that received funding were Miami, Atlanta, and Philadelphia. Um, so we really do see some success in building the capacity and providing that technical assistance, but we're continuing to look um, for additional support there um, and really think about how do we get the resources in the communities to the underserved communities that need it the most. So thank you again for all that you are doing. Um, a few more minutes, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, we can take questions, and for some of you may not know who, if you've, se you've seen me in your community in California and Oregon, is at Walmart, uh, Brooks actually called me and he's like, I'd like to support you more in the fires from 2020 and what you're doing, this is around the time of the Dixie fire, and so that really helped us a lot with capacity and the work that we did too, so whether or not you've know, you know it, they've had an impact um, on your community too. And so I just want to thank you so much for that support. I really do appreciate it. Um, it's unusual, really, for corporate to see the opportunity to get out in front of something. Um, often it's just a total response or reaction. And so I do think that Walmart is particularly lucky to have Brooks in this position because he's been in this world long enough and he's been around, he's been deep enough in it and has made enough relationships that he actually sees the opportunity to do stuff ahead of time and to support um, people on the ground who are doing that kind of work. It's not as usual as you might believe, actually you probably could all believe that in this room. But it's not that usual. It's like when I tell people that Fannie Mae is way ahead of the curve in this work, they're like, 
Really? I'm like, yes. In fact, Fannie Mae has been way ahead of the curve. First one out the gate in many ways to create a disaster-specific team. So there's only a few corporations that are doing that. It is unusual. So, so I thank you for that. Um, do you have any questions for Brooks? Thank you. Thanks for that, Brooks. I just have one question. What do you want to see change? What are you most excited <laughs> about seeing change? Uh, leave, it, leave it to the social scientist, right? It's a great question. Um, I would like to see a lot of the bureaucracy removed. Um, no, I mean, I think, and that's why we've we funded the task force and some of the other research. Um, how do we uncomplicate the complicated um, and make it easier for these communities? I think, um, you know, we're... We're in 5,500 communities across the U.S., and they see it on a daily basis. Um, and unfortunately, I think some of our policymakers only see it when it impacts their their local community. Um, and so uh, corporations and other entities like us that do feel the pain on a daily basis um, hopefully can help push towards some of that change. Thank you for your presentation, Marta, from the state of Oregon. There are a lot of folks here in the room uh, that are with not-for-profits. I'm with several as well. Um, when it comes to Walmart and your philanthropy, it sounds like you have a foundation that's a not-for-profit. Who does Walmart get to be on their board? I mean, Walmart is, you know, up here in terms of their reach. Can you tell us more about your board and how you put that together? Sure. So I'll talk a little bit about the board piece, but I'm also going to talk about how nonprofits can engage with Walmart because there's a number of different opportunities. Um, on the board piece for the Walmart Fund, so that we do have a separate Walmart Foundation, which is is funded through Walmart Corporation. Um, the board is con comprised of um, our CEO and several leaders of our C-suite. Um, and then the president of the foundation also wears two hats. She's also um, our EVP for sustainability, um, which is also very fortunate, I think, for, for me and my work, especially in disaster, because we have an entire sustainability team that's really focused on how do we make an impact through the business um, to make changes towards reducing climate change? And then on the flip side, I get to work on once the climate hazard happens, how do I immediately respond? Um, that is that piece. Within Walmart Foundation, um, we have a program called Spark Good. Um, it is an opportunity for nonprofits across the US to register through the Spark Good platform and that opens you up to local giving grants. So every store, um, Neighborhood Market and Sam's Club has a budget where they can provide local grants to nonprofits. Um, they can be as low as $500 all the way up to $5,000. Um, and those decisions are made at the local level by the store managers. Um, you can also um, do a space request tool and set up a table outside one of our stores if you want to hand out material. Um, you can sign up for a registry. So as, if you want to put together, if there are specific products that you need, you can create a registry and individuals can purchase those items and it's shipped directly to you. Um, you can round, sign up for a roundup um, so customers can round up their donations to go to you. Um, and there's also opportunities for in-kind support through that as well. So. And really quickly, last time, so I was surprised when I went to uh, Walmart uh, like a year and a half ago that you guys have a really sophisticated EOC. I, I just think from a nerdy perspective, that's if you want to talk about that for a minute, because it's, it's pretty cool. Sure. So as in addition to my Walmart.org piece, I wear a, another hat within our emergency operations center. Um, so we do have a designated emergency operations center at, at the headquarters um, that uses, you know, it's monitoring all the disasters. Um, and I run our ESF 10. Um, so it's our emergency support function 10, which is for the community. Um, we do have separate emergency support functions um, compared to FEMA and others. Um, we only have 10. It's uh, people first, um, operations second, and then down the line. Um, all the way to then corporate affairs and the community piece. Um, but we really think about our disaster response as an entire company-wide response. Um, and so really, how do we serve our people first? How do we get our operations back up and running? And then how do we get the community the support they needed, filling those gaps locally and getting to the most underserved? It's very impressive. 
So thank you for that. And and Brooks, thank you for making this trip. And um, is the is the butter cow a real thing in Iowa at the state fair? A hundred percent. Okay. Thank you.